Hello there, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Ruthie Myhall, Director of Development and Alumni Relations at Carolina's College of Health Sciences and the Chair of the College's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. On behalf of the committee, I would like to extend a warm welcome and our sincere appreciation to each of you for joining us as we celebrate Pride Month. We have a great program planned for today, starting with a brief overview and definitions of gender identity versus sexual orientation presented by Carolina's College nursing faculty and fellow diversity, equity, inclusion committee member, Sandra Hammond. It will then be followed by our special guest presenter, Dr. Brian Laurie, who will be sharing a historic overview of healthcare for the LGBTQ plus community, recent advances in healthcare for the transgender population, and information about the Atrium Health Center for Gender Health. We'll conclude our program with some question and answers, but I first have some details about the event to note. Today's event is being recorded and we will make that available to everyone next week. Your camera and microphone should have automatically been turned off upon entry into the event. If not, please do so at this time and we do ask that those remain off throughout the program. We do encourage you to submit questions or comments in the chat feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And you can direct those to me or Megan Brazelton, and we will address as many as we have time for at the end. I will now turn it over to Carolina's College nursing instructor, Sandra Hammond. Sandra? Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Pride Month. Um, I will honestly uh, share with you one of my experiences that allowed me to become more open to the LGBTQIA plus community. A couple of years ago, I was sitting in a conference for oncology and the last session came um, with uh, talking about treating oncology, LGBTQ oncology patients. And, you know, I sat there with a colleague and I was a bit offended because I was like, you know, I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for 15, 16 years. You know, I treat all the patients the same. Um, and she really challenged me um, in looking at my blind spots and recognizing that while I might treat all patients the same, I probably need to do a little bit more um, in addressing some issues for our LGBTQ community. So if you were like me, um, a lot of the uh, terminology that's being used is foreign to me. So we'll take a little minute to watch this short uh, video and we'll talk on the other side. And with what's inside of your pants. It is often assumed that everyone is born either male or female, but what a lot of people don't know is that biological sex lies on a spectrum. Everyone who is not 100% male or female is called intersex. Now, what exactly is intersexuality? Approximately one in 3,000 babies is born with ambiguous genitals, which for example could look like this. In this case, doctors often can't determine immediately whether the baby is a boy or a girl. There are also other ways in which a person can be considered intersex. For example, through a difference in the level of your chromosomes, your gonads, or your hormones. So what does the passport of an intersex person look like? In Belgium, it is up to now only possible to be legally registered as an M or an F. This means that there is no possibility for intersex people to have their biological sex recognized by the state, so people often have to choose the sex of the baby at birth. In the entire world, only seven countries and five American states have some sort of legal recognition for intersexuality, which is not a lot. We covered sex, but what about gender? Your gender or gender identity denotes how you feel. A person can feel exclusively feminine or ultra-masculine, but this too lies on a spectrum. 
it is perfectly possible to feel a little bit more masculine than feminine, or the other way around. Some people feel both male and female, or neither, and just want to be themselves. To define these gender identities, a lot of complicated names exist, such as these ones. Each of these words describes a slightly different gender identity. However, this is not written in stone, and only you can decide which word fits you the best. When one's sex and gender identity align, for example, when you are born female and you feel like a woman, we call this person cisgender. However, when one's sex and gender identity do not correspond, we call this person transgender. We do not, however, use the word transsexual. Originally, this word was used to describe trans people who had undergone gender confirmation surgery, but nowadays this is considered outdated and sometimes even hurtful. Besides, not everyone who is transgender wants to have a surgery, of course. The third aspect of our gender is comprised of how we present ourselves to the outside world and of how others perceive us. We call this our gender expression. Just like the other aspects, your expression can also be female or male or something in between. A person's gender expression exists of many layers. The most obvious one is of course the clothing you wear. Do you wear manly clothes or feminine clothes? However, also your haircut, the way you talk, the way you move, walk or sit, the hobbies or interests you have, the books you read, the music you listen to, the movie genres you like, and even the drinks you order on a night out are gendered. So, basically everything. Important to remember here is that what is considered masculine or feminine is incredibly time and location bound. These ideas are not the same everywhere and at all times. A funny example are high heels. While the Western world now sees them as typically feminine footwear, in the Middle Ages it was completely normal for men to wear shoes like these. Now, what exactly is meant with transvestism? A transvestite is someone who takes on the stereotypical gender expression of the opposite sex. Here, for example, you see Lady Gaga, who takes on a male gender expression. Or the world-famous drag queen RuPaul, who takes on a female gender expression. It doesn't all have to be so binary. When someone doesn't limit themselves to the categories of man or woman and just mixes it all together, we use the word androgyny. A widely known example of a person with an androgynous gender expression is David Bowie. The fourth aspect of your gender has to do with who you are sexually or romantically attracted to. We call this your attraction. You can feel attracted to men or women. A person who likes people from the opposite gender is called heterosexual. A person who likes people from the same gender is called homosexual. You can also, of course, like both genders, which is then called bisexuality. Once again, it doesn't have to be so black and white. Human sexuality is considered to be fluid, which means that it is changeable throughout time and depends on the situation. You can, for example, feel incredibly attracted to men, but also a tiny bit to women. Or it could happen that even though you felt attracted to women your entire life, all of a sudden you fall in love with a man. Some people also identify as pansexual. In this case, your attraction is not confined within the borders of the binary gender spectrum and you actually feel attracted to a person's personality rather than their sex. Another sexuality which falls outside of the spectrum is asexuality. Asexual people do not feel sexual attraction to others at all. This, however, does not mean that they do not long for a romantic relationship or affection, just no sex. Even though you cannot choose your sexuality, identity and labels seem to be very important to define one's attraction. Labels like gay and straight exist because a lot of people find comfort in the idea of belonging to a group and use these words as tools for explaining their identity to others. These labels are, however, not clearly defined. Which labels you choose to describe yourself and how you define them is highly personal and can never be wrong. After all, nobody knows you better than yourself. Moreover, you are not obligated to give yourself a label at all. As you see, your gender is a lot more complicated than what they expect from you at birth. The gender bread cookie is not even complete. The construction of a person's gender is an incredibly complex process which involves psychology, biology, sociology, and so much more. Capturing this process in a small cookie would be very ambitious, but it's a start.
Okay, so that gives us a little bit of an overview. As an update, we now have 10 states um, in the United States and in Washington, D.C., who will also, um, Um, allows us to have a third gender, um, either that be through your um, birth certificate or through your license. So we, now we have uh, 10 states plus Washington, D.C. that allows that. I think this conversation today is so important because it allows us to go past what we know um, and uh, actually focus on our patients. So uh, Ruthie, I'll turn it over to you and let you proceed. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, great information and great way to start the program. It is now my pleasure to introduce our special guest presenter, Dr. Brian Laurie. Dr. Laurie is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Division Director for General Academic Pediatrics at Atrium Health Levine Children's Hospital. He also serves as the Medical Director for Myers Park Clinic and the Assistant Director of the Pediatric Residency Program. Dr. Laurie graduated from Tufts University with a major in clinical psychology and earned his medical degree from the Sackler School of Medicine, New York State American Program in Tel Aviv, Israel. He completed his pediatric residency at North Shore Children's Hospital in Manhasset, New York, and went on to obtain his Master's of Public Health from Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. Dr. Lari has experience developing and implementing a curriculum for pediatric residents on caring for patients who are LGBTQA+. He has published on this topic and has given multiple talks and led multiple workshops nationally, focusing on LGBTQA plus care, diversity and inclusion, and social justice in medicine. Most recently, he helped with the development and implementation of the Levine Children's Center for Gender Health. Welcome, Dr. Lowry. Thank, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Do you guys see my thing I shared the wrong? Do you see the presentation? Oh, good. Yes. Perfect. Um, let me start it. There we go. OK. Well, thank you for having me. And I'm really, really thrilled to be talking to this group, especially during Pride. Happy Pride, everybody. Um, it is my honor to be here. and. As Ruthie said, I have done a lot of talks about LGBT health, but um, this was the first time I was actually asked to speak about a historical perspective, and I learned a lot myself, and I found it to be very interesting, so I'm excited to share it all with you guys. Um, so what will our objectives be today? Well, to understand the history and origins of healthcare disparities for LGBTQ plus patients, describe recent advances in policy related to LGBTQ plus healthcare. And then I want to introduce everyone to the Levine Children's Center for Gender Health. I will disclose that I am not speaking too much about the actual medicine or treatment of transgender individuals today, more um, looking at recent advances that are helping to decrease some of the stigma and discrimination that LGBTQ people have faced in healthcare. So in 2011, the Institute of Medicine put out a report titled The Health of Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender People, Building a Foundation for Better Understanding. In the report was written, although LGBT people share with the rest of society the full range of health risks, they also face a profound and poorly understood set of additional risks due largely to social stigma. There is a long history of anti-LGBT bias in healthcare, which continues to shape health-seeking health behavior and access to care for LGBT individuals. This occurs despite increasing social acceptance. Understanding LGBT health starts with understanding the history of oppression that these communities have faced. Contemporary health disparities based on sexual orientation and gender identity are rooted in and reflect the historical stigmatization and discrimination of LGBT people. 
Examples include legal discrimination and access to health insurance, employment, housing, marriage, adoption, and retirement benefits. Their lack of laws protecting against bullying in schools. Lack of social programs targeted to and or appropriate for LGBT youth, adults, and elders. We also know there is a shortage of healthcare providers who are knowledgeable and culturally competent in LGBT health. Most LGBT people encounter stigma from an early age, and this experience shapes how they perceive and interact with all aspects of society, including health-related institutions. Likewise, heterosexual people, including many healthcare professionals, have been socialized in a society that stigmatizes sexual and gender minorities, and this context inevitably affects their knowledge and perception of LGBT people. So now we'll have a little bit of a history lesson. In 1860, um, the concept of the sexual invert historically preceded that of the homosexual as a target for medical and scientific scrutiny. Carl Ulrich, who was actually a German lawyer and pioneer of gay rights, coined the term to describe individuals who are born with the sexual drive of women, but have male bodies. Magnus Hirschfeld, a German physician, supported this argument and posited that inverts represented an intermediate sex, reflecting, reflecting both male and female qualities. This concept of inversion focused on the sexual aim or preference for particular types of sexual activity. Later on in the 1930s, Freud introduced the modern notion of sexual orientation. He defined the concept of heterosexual and homosexual not in terms of the sexual aim, but in terms of the sexual object, either a person of the opposite or the same gender, and the concept of inversion went away. The division into homosexuals and heterosexuals led to a stigmatization of the latter, of the earlier homosexuals, mainly because consensual same sexual behavior was already considered both illegal and a form of mental illness. Sodomy laws in the United States were laws that made certain kinds of sexual activity illegal. The first sodomy laws in America were created when America was still a colony of the British Empire. Almost every state in the United States had laws against sodomy. The main effect of sodomy laws was not prosecution, but were used to justify differential treatment of sexual minorities in employment, child custody, immigration, and licensing in many organizations. Medicine worked at that time much more as a criminalizing and penalizing force for many gender and sexual minorities during the first half of the 20th century than as a healing one. It wasn't until 1948 when Kinsey published research that challenged the concept that identifying as lesbian or gay was a mental illness. He uncovered that most people aren't absolutely straight or gay or lesbian his research showed that sexual behavior, thoughts, and feelings towards the same or opposite sex were not always consistent across time and fell onto a spectrum as opposed to two concrete categories, as we just saw in that video. Despite this groundbreaking research, in 1952, the American Psychiatric Association's newly created Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or the DSM, listed homosexuality as a sociopathic personality disturbance. This led to many providers attempting various cures and treatments, all of which generally left patients physically or psychologically scarred and mistrusting of medicine. This was the birth of conversion therapy and included tactic, tactics such as psychotherapy, hormone treatments, aversive conditioning with nausea-inducing drugs, lobotomy, electroshock, and castration. The theory behind aversion therapy hypothesized that after treatment, patients would associate homosexual arousal with pain and unpleasantness, train themselves to shun homosexual thoughts, and thus cure themselves of homosexuality. However, things began to change in 1961 when Illinois became the first state in the United States to get rid of its sodomy law. In 1969, Stonewall, Stonewall helped change these views. During a police raid on June 27, 1969, the reason why we celebrate Pride Month in June, um, this police raid on the Stonewell Inn, which was a bar in New York City, 
Patrons and neighborhood residents resisted the police in a confrontation that escalated into a riot and continued for several nights. This rebellion marked the beginning of LGBTQ civil rights. What it did for medicine was in addition to more and more research proving wrong the notion that identifying L as LGBTQ was an illness, it caused the American Psychiatric Association to remove homosexuality as a diagnosis from the DSM. This occurred in 1973. The APA urged the medical community, community to eradicate the stigma historically associated with being LGBTQ. However, despite the medical disentangling of homosexuality from mental illness, this did not equate to quality medical care for LGBTQ patients. While a growing number of doctors no longer viewed their LGBTQ patients as innately sick, they rarely knew how to ensure their health as few had ever received any medical training on LGBTQ specific health issues or treatment. Lastly, changing the medical classification did not erase the larger social stigma and discrimination against LGBTQ individuals that almost a century of medical research helped to build and support. It was only worsened by the AIDS epidemic. In 1981, doctors identified the first cases of what they termed gay-related immune deficiency or GRID. Soon the disease's name was changed to AIDS or acquired immune deficiency syndrome. The AIDS crisis of the 1980s showcased the full and lasting extent of this discrimination. Gay men as a group, whether infected or not, experience extreme forms of discrimination in healthcare, employment, and everyday life as a public fear of contracting the deadly disease that no one at that time understood. For those infected, the stigma and fear surrounding AIDS translated into tragic injustices, ranging from denial of hospital services to eviction and job loss. During the 1990s and 2000s, however, the visibility of the LGBT community increased dramatically in most facets of US society. The last 20 years have seen various events that have affected the life of sexual minorities including the US Supreme Court decision that finally struck down all sodomy laws in the United States. Now we're gonna speak a little bit about the history of healthcare for transgender individuals. Going back to 1918, Magnus Hirschfeld, who we discussed earlier, who um, coined the term invert, now coined the term transvestite at his Institute for Sexual Science in Berlin. He defined transvestism as a desire to express one's gender in opposition to their defined sex. In a time when his contemporaries aimed to cure transgender patients of their alleged mental affliction, Hirschfeld supported those who wanted to live according to the gender they felt most aligned with, they, who they felt they most aligned with as opposed to the gender that their sex obligated them to abide by. Going against the grain, he was one of the first to offer his patients the means to achieve a sex change, either through hormone therapy or operations or both. In 1947, Kinsey was one of the first to use the term transsexual in his gender studies, and he helped introduce this concept to America. The first American to undergo a sex change op operation was Christine Jorgensen, who brought significant attention to the transgender revolution in America when her story hit the New York Times headlines in 1952. Jorgensen's willingness to publicly tell her story helped bring a face to the growing transgender revolution in the States. But that time, at that time, the lack of quality transgender healthcare in the US meant that Jorgensen had to travel to Denmark to get the treatment she needed. In 1979, a study came out at Johns Hopkins University which uh, called sex reassignment surgeries into question by suggesting that psychosocial outcomes in transgender patients who underwent reassignment surgery were not actually better than those who did not go, undergo the surgery. In, a, in an attempt to standardize care in response to this study's acquisitions, the Henry Benjamin International Gender Dysphoria, Dysphoria Association now better known as the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, or WPATH, created the first version of standards of care for the health of transsexual, transgender, and gender non-conforming people. Now in its seventh iteration, the WPATH standards of care provide guidance on everything from hormone therapy to surgical interventions and everything in between. 
Despite all the apparent advancements in transgender health care we discussed, the 1980 edition of Gender Identity Disorder to the American Psychiatrics Association DSM-3 seemed like a giant leap backwards. However, this controversial move actually helped transgender individuals gain access to a healthcare system which had previously discriminated against transgender individuals. In 2009, the Endocrine Society put together their brief clinical practice guidelines. These guidelines cover diagnosis, treatment, and preventive care needs for transgender patients, while also drawing attention to the potential risk associated with gender transition therapies. Slowly but surely, strides were made towards removing the notion of disorder in the context of gender identity. And in the release of the DSM-5 in 2013, gender identity disorder was replaced with the diagnosis gender dysphoria to shift the focus to the mental and physical distress felt by many transgender people. Destigmatization of this diagnosis was a major milestone for transgender individuals in America, and further strides were achieved when a government appeals board in 2014 ruled that Medicare must cover surgery for gender transitions, overturning a policy that had been in place since the 1980s. More recently, I can't have this discussion with talking about some of the um, effects the ACA had on transgender care. All people who need medical care should be able to see their doctor without worrying about being mistreated, harassed, harassed, or denied service outright. The Affordable Care Act helped address this issue by pre prohibiting healthcare providers and insurance companies from engaging in discrimination. Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act enacted in 2010 prohibits discrimination in healthcare based on race, color, national origin, sex, age, or disability. In 2016, the Department of Health and Human Services issued regulations establishing that the prohibition of discrimination based on sex should be understood to include discrimination based on gender identity. As a result of that 2016 definition, health providers and insurance companies that received federal funding had to provide the same access to coverage services and care to transgender people that they would to cisgender people. This includes all gender affirming care. However, in 2020, the Trump administration reversed section 1557 by changing the de definition of sex and defining it to mean the gender assigned at birth, thereby excluding transgender people from the law's umbrella of protection. On May 10th of this year, the Biden administration said it would provide protections against discrimination in healthcare experienced by transgender people by reversing the Trump administration policy. Now let's talk about health disparities and why they exist. So although the stigma and disc discrimination we just discussed in healthcare, as well as societal homophobia and transphobia leads to many of the health disparities LGBTQ people face. Minority stress, let me, minority stress is the cumulative burden of being reminded that one is different than the rest of society. This could be because of external sources, so being targeted or victimized by others, internal stressors, a sense of not fitting in, um, a sense of shame or fear of rejection, an eternal response to a homophobic and transgender, transphobic society may be to conceal one's gender, identity, or sexual orientation. This concealment over time leads to psychological distress, also known as the divided self, which further leads to increased vulnerability to mental health concerns. Looking at it another way, I have a few examples that show the consequences of stigma and discrimination. So stigma and discrimination exists. It leads to both acute and chronic stress for the individual. And the impacts of that acute and chronic stress could be on your mental health, your physical health, your access to care, and also the quality of care you receive. And all of that is going to lead to health issues and inequalities. An example, if we look at LGBTQ youth, there are a lack of laws protecting against bullying um, in school, verbal harassment, physical assault, lack of intervention by school staff. 
Um, this leads to both the acute and chronic stress, which can cause us uh, these children to have increased rates of missing school, carrying a weapon to school, or even dropping out. All of that leads to social isol isolation, depression, anxiety, homelessness, and all of that leads to increased rates, increased rates of suicide, alcohol, and substance abuse amongst LGBTQ plus youth. Looking at it for our transgender patients, their social rec rejection, lack of legal recognition, and acceptance for transgender patients leading to stress. The stress can be lead to denial of education, employment, and housing opportunities, causing poverty and uh, decreased access to care, which could lead to any health condition really, but one of the most common is higher rates of HIV amongst transgender patients. So health disparities which currently exist for the LGBTQIA plus population include those listed here plus, plus more. We know that gay men are at higher risk of HIV and other STDs. This is especially true among communities of color. Lesbian and bisexual females are more likely to be overweight or obese. Suicide risk in all adolescents is associated with isolation, homelessness, and substance abuse. Transgender individuals have higher prevalence of HIV, STDs, victimization, mental health issues, and suicide, and are less likely to have health insurance than their heterosexual or LGB individuals. There's a disproportionate risk for violent hate crimes, bullying, certain cancers, including anal, breast, and cervical cancer. And studies show that same-sex partnered people are less likely to have health insurance and more likely to report unmet health needs. For women um, who identify as LGBT, they're less likely to have had a recent mammogram or a pap smear. So, Speaking of lack of access and barriers to care, which still exist, a large survey by Lambda Legal entitled When Healthcare Isn't Caring um, examined the barriers of care that exist for different populations, uh, for the LGBTQ populations. 56% of lesbian, gay, and bisexual respondents had experienced serious discrimination in healthcare. 70% of transgender respondents had experienced serious discrimination, 73% of transgender respondents and 29% of LGB respondents reported that they believed they would be treated differently by medical professionals because of their LGBTQ status. LGBTQ patients reported that there was um, use of excessive precautions or the provider refused to touch them. Um, they were blamed for their own health status and providers often used harsh or abusive language. Transgender patients reported that they were harassed in their doctor's office, and 19% actually said they were denied medical care. And these attitudes have consequences. Many LGBT people report reluctance to reveal their sexual orientation or gender identity to their providers. Many also decided to not see their physicians in the last few years because of their fear of what might occur. Let's look at some recent advances now and setbacks. And a lot of what we're gonna look at is policy. Although the removal of homosexuality from the DSM helped create more acceptance in the medical world, to this day, many still believe that their sexual orientation can be changed. A contentious legislative debate still rages on regarding conversion therapy, with more states banning conversion therapy for minors due to limited effective effectiveness versus a high likelihood of harm. Conversion therapy laws prohibit licensed medical mental health practitioners from subjecting LGBTQ minors to harmful for conversion therapy practices that attempt to change their sexual orientation or gender identity. On this slide, the green states are the 20 states that have laws which actually ban conversion therapy for minors. The light green, four states, including North Carolina, have partial laws which ban conversion therapy for minors. The three orange states are, in a feder feder are currently in a federal judicial circuit with a preliminary injunction currently preventing enforcement of conversion therapy bans. And the tan states, 23 states on this slide, have no state law or policy um, against conversion therapy. 
this slide is demonstrating um, different insurance policies. So insurance non-discrimination laws and policies protect LGBTQ people from being unfairly denied health insurance coverage or from being unfairly excluded from coverage for certain healthcare procedures on the basis of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Transgender exclusion and health insurance um, service coverage is prohibited in 24 states. Law prohibits health insurance discrimination, discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity in 16 states. In 27 states, the TAN states, including North Carolina, there is no law providing LGBTQ inclusive insurance protections. And in one state, Arkansas, the law explicitly permits insurance insurers to refuse to cover gender affirming care. This is the state Medicaid laws. State Medicaid policies reflect varying interpretations of federal regulations that prohibit discrimination based on gender identity. Some state policies explicitly say that the state's Medicaid program covers medically necessary care for transgender people, whereas other state policies explicitly exclude such care. Still, other states have no explicit policy either way. Importantly, even in the states without an explicit policy, transgender people may still be able to access transgender inclusive coverage or benefits. However, when states have no explicit policy, transgender people are more likely to report obstacles to receiving care, including be being denied their needed care. State medical policy explicitly covers healthcare related to gender transition for transgender people in 22 states. That's the green ones here. In 17 states, the TAN states, including North Carolina, state Medicaid has no explicit policy regarding transgender health coverage and care. In 11 states, the orange states, state, medica, med, state Medicaid policy explicitly excludes transgender health care and coverage. And finally, in medical care bans. As many of you heard in the news lately, in 2021 alone, legislatures in 22 states have introduced bills to ban best practice medical care for transgender young people. Additionally, bills in 13 states would create criminal penalties for providing health care to transgender youth, even though this care adheres to guidance from leading medical organizations. Denying best practice medical care and support to transgender youth can be life threatening, which can contribute to depression, social isolation, risk of self harm and suicidal behavior, among other negative impacts. In only one state currently is it illegal to provide care to transgender individuals. The law actually states that if you provide care to a transgender youth, you can go to jail. However, recently in 2018, the American Academy of Pediatrics released a policy document on how to care for transgender and gender nonconforming youth. This was the AAP's first policy statement focus on transgender youth, which urge pediatricians and other healthcare providers to provide a safe and inclusive clinical space for these patients. And that led and encouraged us to develop the Levine Children's Center for Gender Health, which I'd like to introduce to you today. The center has actually been open now for about a year and a half, um, and our, uh, our, our patient load has increased dramatically in that year and a half. We gone from we went from one half day a week a month to uh, four half days a week to care for patients who identify as transgender. So our mission when we created this uh, center was to improve the health, elevate the hope, and advance the healing for all gender diverse children, adolescents, and young adults by providing unparalleled, compassionate, affirming medical and mental health care, promoting education and understanding to patients, families, providers, and communities, and advocating for the needs and well-being of our gender diverse patients and their families. Affirmation, formerly known as transitioning, is the process of bringing one's body into alignment with one's gender identity. Many view the process as an affirmation and an acceptance of who they have always been rather than a transition from one gender to the other. Affirmation can take many forms. It could be social, which is reversible, 
And that's just changing clothing, hairstyles, pronouns, names, which express their, um, their asserted gender identity. There could be legal affirmation. This is when the name and gender markers are changed on legal documents. Medical affirmation, where we use cross-sex hormones to allow adolescents and young adults to develop secondary sex characteristics of the opposite biologic sex. And then there's surgical affirmation, which is top or bottom surgery. On this slide, we describe the gender affirm affirmative care model. There's limited, but a growing body of evidence that shows that this model results in fewer mental health concerns for transgender individuals. So what is gender affirmative care? It's developmentally appropriate care that is oriented towards understanding and appreciating the gender experience. It offers a strong, non-judgmental partnership with youth and families, allowing for questions and concerns to be raised in a supportive environment. It involves integration of medical, mental health, social services, and specific resources and support. Most importantly, it promotes the child's self-worth. It facilitates access to care for transgender individuals. It educates family and community, and it advocates for the patient. Here is the roadmap that we use for our gender health center. At the first visit, um, before the first visit, we will get, the patient will either refer themselves or be referred by a provider. And they will directly call, uh, we will directly call them back. One of our social workers or nurse triages will call them back and get a little bit of a history from them. At their first visit, the provider obtains a medical history and performs a physical exam. The provider will ask about the patient's and family's medical history. They will identify medical issues that the patient has and any issues that they may need to be addressed. The patient at that visit is also seen by a social worker who performs a psychosocial interview. The social worker will help understand the how the patient and family or guardians are functioning and if there are any specific needs. Once the medical history, physical exam, and psychosocial interview are completed, the care team will answer questions, provide resources, and develop a treatment plan for the patient. What services are we currently offering? So we are offering at um, gender affirming medical treatment and mental health services, including pubertal blockers, cross sex hormones, mental health support and readiness discussions. We can also make referrals to other medical service providers as needed and desired, and this includes gynecology, psychiatry, plastic surgery, pediatric endocrinology, speech and language pathology, and nutrition. For younger children, we offer consultation services to gender diverse youth and their families. We offer family support services and linkage to outside resources for the families case management services, including assistance with legal name and gender marker changes. And we're also providing education to providers, schools, and the community. The treatment plan for each patient will be individualized based on the needs and preferences for the patient and the family or their guardians. And the clinic's treatments are consistent with the guidelines developed by the professional societies we discussed earlier, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, WPATH, and the Endocrine Society. That is all I have. I'm willing to take all questions now. I'll stop sharing. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Lara. We really um, appreciate this. What fantastic information. Um, and a lot to think about. Um, we did have some questions come through um, the chat. So I'm gonna jump right to those. First question is, how can I be supportive of transgender family members, friends, or significant others? Sure. Um, I think the first way to be supportive is to make sure you use the pronouns, their affirm pronouns, their affirm name. Um, it's okay to make mistakes when speaking with transgender individuals. Just apologize if you do make a mistake and ask, you know, to, what pronoun would you like me to use? What name would you like me to use? Did I use a term that um, inappropriate? Or if 
a transgender individual, someone in your family uses a term you don't know, ask them what that means and say, you just wanna be better educated. I think that's one great way of being supportive. Another way is really just be their ally. You know, um, If you hear derogatory terms or homophobic, transphobic things from people in your family or members of your friend group or society, challenge people, say, what do you mean by that? Um, that could be considered derogatory and maybe we should be looking at it this way. I think those are you know, ways to always be supportive. In the healthcare um, profession, I think there's ways we could be supportive by just letting our patients know that we're open and willing to be accepting. Um, make sure, you know, introduce yourself with the pronouns you use. Um, you could wear like, uh, you know, a rainbow flag on your ID badge or even the HRC, um, the human rights campaign uh, symbol. You could put that a little sticker on your ID badge. So people know that you're accepting and that you're willing to affirm them for who they are. Thank you. Next question is, what is your recommendation regarding parental slash adult language towards preteens and teens who have had no previous desire to be transgender, but who now firmly express desire to be referred to as transgender? Um, for example, changing pronouns. Can you repeat that one more time? <laughs> <Go Yeah>. on. <laughs> yes. Uh, what is your recommendation regarding parental or adult language towards preteens and teens who have had no previous desire to be transgender, but who now firmly express a desire to be referred to as transgender? So, I mean, in those situations, I'm going to actually say that the child probably did have desire or did identify as transgender prior to the family knowing about it or the parents and adults knowing about it. Um, most children will recognize their gender identity by age three um, and it's firmly established by age four. So chances are the child was, you know, um, thinking about it for a long time. And to define yourself as transgender is actually, it has to be persistent over time, insistent, so it's a constant thought they have, and consistent, so they're having the same thought over and over again. If they're now expressing to their parents they wish to change their name, to change their pronouns, to change the way they look, to change their hairstyle, whatever, you know, anywhere on the spectrum of um, affirming their gender, the, you know, I hope the parents could be supportive of that. And um, it's hard, it's definitely hard because adults are going to mourn the loss of a child they thought they had, but they have to get on board pretty quickly because we know that the number one positive impact on a LGBTQIA plus child's life is family support. And that is the biggest way to decrease health disparities for this population. So I really think, you know, adults need to listen to the child, follow their lead, um, and go along with what's best for, for that particular child. So to help decrease those, those health um, disparities. Now, there are some children who might be considered gender diverse, which is not um, necessarily transgender. And so gender diverse are children who, um, you know, may not wish to identify with either gender or identify with both gender or may identify with the gender that is opposite their natal sex, but don't want to express themselves that way or go through any sort of affirmation. Um, and that could be confusing for adults and parents and things like that sometimes. The way I like to think about it is um, all transgender individuals are gender diverse, but not all gender diverse individuals are transgender. So it's a larger umbrella gender diverse. Um, and that could be confusing, but I still think the, the tenet is still the same. Follow your child's lead, let them express themselves the, the way they wish to express themselves and tell you how they wish to express themselves and support that. I hope that answered that question. 
I think it did. Um, I think it's a, a clear message of, and and the the person who asked the question just um, put in the chat. Yes, thank you. Um, and I, I'm I'm just hearing communication is just so honest, vulnerable communication. Exactly, exactly. It's honest, vulnerable communication. It's it's admitting that you don't know it all, but you're willing to take the journey with your child. Um, it's you know it's. It's being accepting, it's being an ally, it's being open, letting the child know that they have a support system. You know, for, for us as a pediatrician, and when I teach the pediatric residents, one of the things I tell them is, you might be the first and only person that a child might come out to, whether LGBTQIA plus anywhere on the spectrum. Um, so we have to let them know this is a safe, warm environment where they're not gonna be judged and they're not gonna be um, ridiculed. And just doing that is, is goes a long way. Great. A couple more here. Um, one goes back to earlier in your presentation, and the question is, why is it that there is a higher occurrence of HIV in the transgender population as compared to the gay and lesbian population? Um, I think now um, it's mostly because transgender individuals have been um, discriminated against a little bit longer than LGBT. I think the LGBT, especially with Stonewall, it really brought the movement forward and moved it quick, moved it forward quicker, especially in the 80s during the um, HIV epidemic. And then again, in the 90s and 2000s, there was a lot of attention placed on um, you know, preventive services and a lot more opened up to the LGBT population because of that. There's been a lot more discrimination, especially continuing till now for the transgender community. And that discrimination and um, transphobia and stigma leads to a lot, you know, it leads to a lot of the health disparities that we discussed, but some of what it leads to is being thrown out of your house being more, you know, more rates of homelessness. And because of that, there's um, this, this um, you, you turn to survival sex and there's a lot of transgender individuals who have to turn to survival sex, which is you're homeless, you're trying to make some money just for food. Um, so you, you, you know, you prostitute yourself. And because of that, you don't always use protection because you're, um, just trying to stay alive and you're doing what the other person wants. There's also more increased rates lately of um, sexual assault and victimization that could lead to HIV. So I think it's just we're seeing it more often now because it's not a population, unfortunately, that we focused on as intently as we did with the LGV population earlier on. Thank you. This next question is basically regarding what can we do. So it's it says, other than vote, what can we do to help get these discriminatory healthcare policies changed and help to lessen or eliminate healthcare discrimination and disparities? So the first thing is definitely educate, educate, educate. We need to educate everyone, um, you know, and it, it needs to start small and work its way up. So if you wanna start small within the healthcare system, right? Let's take Atrium for an example. In one, every one of our offices, no matter where you practice or what age you cater to or whoever you're, you know, whatever type of doctor you are, um, a gender diverse and, or an LGB individual can walk into your office. And you know what? It's a hidden, it's, it's a, you know, we, we call it the silent minority because it's, you know, they're not coming out and telling you that they're LGB just walking in the door. So we have to be having practices right from the front desk when they come into our office that really shows that we're open, we're inclusive, um, we're happy to have any conversation. We should have posters in every office that, that represents LGBTQ people. We should have pamphlets out. We should have resources available, even just in our waiting rooms. Um, Everyone in the office has to be educated from the front desk up to the providers uh, on how to how we should speak, you know, to use um, the, the correct pronouns, to use the names uh, that that the affirm names that that our patients are using. We should have um, I totally just lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> we, we glad it happens to you too. <laughs> we go, yeah, definitely. Um, we should also then, you know, from the office, we should be educating our administration. Our administration really needs to have make sure that um, we have non discrimination policies, which which we do at Atrium. And I was actually giving a talk probably in 2018 when I first got here, and Atrium has had said they posted their non-discrimination policy online and I went to bring it up during the talk and it actually wasn't posted online. So I went right to the administration and I said, we have one, it needs to be visible. We need to make our policies visible. We should have an LGBT um, patient rights. Like we have patient, you know, uh, bill of rights for, our, for all our patients. There should be a bill of rights for LGBTQ patients as well. New York just instituted those and they have them posted in every hospital that you walk into. Um, but you can, you know, and then continuing to advocate on higher levels. So it doesn't have to be just, you know, it doesn't have to be vote, but speak to your congressmen, speak to your senators, send them emails saying that, you know, th that these laws need to change. Um, the more people that send stuff, the more people are going to listen because they're going to see that their constituents are interested in this topic. We need to be vocal. Uh, we need to be allies. Um, and, you know, it's, it's all our responsibility, not just the responsibility of our LGBTQ patients to push forward the human rights agenda. You know, it's equality for everyone. It's equality for all. Um, I think the easiest thing, like I said, just for all of us to start doing is just go out and you could order them online a little rainbow flag sticker and, or even a transgender, there's a transgender flag and just put it on your badge. It lets somebody know that you're accepting. Use your, use your pronouns a lot. Like I, I, in all my emails have my pronouns in my email. I have my, um, when I introduce myself to patients, I use my pronouns that, that I go by. Um, and I, I have a pin that says my pronouns are, you could get those online too. It's just letting patients know that you're available to them. And I think that's the easiest thing. It's harder to advocate on a national level, but um, the more you do the smaller things, the more it'll add up. And I think that's something we can all do. Fantastic. One of the questions did actually revolve around, um, while we realize it's only been open a year and a half, um, most people on this call, on this meeting, were unaware of myself included, unaware that Atrium had a center, center for gender health. Um, and I'm assuming, you know, this is like preaching to the choir, but shouldn't this be more uh, visible within mm -hmm. our Atrium family even? Oh, yes. And and I agree. And, and we've been pushing for that. And we're like, like you're, it is preaching to the choir, like you said. Um, we have, we're really pushing it forward. Um, I think we've done a good job of advertising and marketing to the outpatient pediatric community because they're the ones who are referring mostly to us, but we haven't done a good job of getting it past that. Um, it was mentioned briefly at the For All conference two years ago when we had it before uh, COVID hit. Um, it was mentioned that the center started, but that was as far as advertisement I've heard since. Um, we have to be doing a better job. And that's why I totally appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today, just to get that out there. Because even if you have a friend or a colleague or a patient in your office who says, I don't know where to go, you can say, hey, I just heard of this and you can refer to us. Um, if you look at the uh, Teen Health website, which is our adolescent medicine department in pediatrics, we do have um, a link and a whole page for the Gender Health Center, which will tell you how to refer to us and um, how you can learn more about us. But we need to get the, the word spread. I've been doing a lot of talks with um, PFLAG though, as well, um, parents and families of lesbian and gay individuals. And they have, um, I, I've been doing talks throughout the community. So that's how we've been building up the business for the patients because a lot of our transgender youth have been looking for someone in the area. They've been going up to Duke for years to get their treatment and they're just thrilled now. So a lot of it in the community is being spread by word of mouth, which is good. So we just have to continue to do that. Uh, one last question before I wrap it up uh, that's along those lines from one of our participants is um, what is the best way to get someone in touch with the program at LCH as far as the um, gender uh, care? Yeah, 
I think the best way is um, if, if you go to the teen health website, um, the gender health number is there. So you could always just pass that number on. Um, if somebody wants to make a referral, there is a referral in Cerner under referrals for gender health. Um, so if a uh, nurse or a provider wants to put in that referral, that's that's good too. I um, should have had it, but I don't have it in front of me, the phone number. Um, but I can, you know, if you want me to email it to you, Ruthie, and then we that can- That would be great. And I can share it with all the participants when we send um, a, a recording of the event. So that would be fantastic. Perfect. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. I think we could talk for days on these topics. And if I didn't get to your question, I do apologize. But we do hope that each of you do just that within your own circle. And that is continue to talk about this. Talk about what you learned today. Maybe talk about what you unlearned today. Um, I know I personally have a lot of things to um, process and share. And I, I agree that Communication, but honest communication is, um, is so very important. So on behalf of the Carolinas College Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee, I'd like to thank our guest presenters, Sandra Hammond and Dr. Brian Laurie, as well as each one of you for participating today. Thank you and have a wonderful weekend.